Hello. Oh, it is recording. I see the little figure. Okay, great. I will do my little spiel and then I'll introduce you. Nice. Okay, here I go. Hi, I'm Sue from the Sounds and Mind Room Research Centre at the University of Edinburgh and I'm recording another psychological, um, which is our sort of little podcasty type series that we're doing during the COVID-19 lockdown to try and um, contribute to the debate that's going on at the moment about kind of children and young people's well-being and learning and maybe give people something slightly more intellectual to think about while they're stuck at home. Um, today I'm talking to Joni Holmes from the University of Cambridge and she's going to talk to me about a paper that she did um, using a network approach to look at transdiagnostic associations across communication, cognitive and behavioural problems. So it's a very um, wide-ranging paper, it sounds like. Um, so, hello, Joni. How are you? Hi, Sue. I'm good, thank you. Very nice to good. talk to you. It's lovely to talk to you, too. Thank you for giving me some of your time. You're um, very welcome. So what did you... As I say, this paper seems like it covers a lot. Is it possible to summarise what you found? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll do my best. <laughs> so we found that symptoms of communication, behavioural and everyday cognitive problems don't fit into the neat boxes that we might think they once did when we think about specific developmental disorders. What we actually found was that rather than these symptoms fitting into these neat boxes assigned to disorders, the symptoms interact dynamically and that means that they cause one another and they kind of reinforce each other. So really we found that this sort of symptom-specific idea of diagnosis doesn't actually hold when you look at data from children who are struggling at school. Oh, wow. And could you give me uh, a sort of um, specific example of the kind of interactions you're talking about, you know, even just as a sort of metaphor to help us ground that a little bit more? Yes. Yeah, so if we think about, um, say, for example, symptoms of um, inattention, so you struggle to pay attention, for example, in a classroom situation, um, and you find yourself easily distracted. And often people would assume that that would be related, for example, to a disorder like ADHD. Uh -huh. But what we found is that it's not just related to other symptoms of ADHD, but that inattention is related to cognitive problems and also to some kind of language and communication problems as well. So we find that these symptoms don't fit neatly in categories that we would associate with a specific disorder. And in fact, they can co-occur or even cause and reinforce symptoms that we would have thought were associated with different disorders. Right. Because, so this is quite a superficial reading, but, you know, let's say you're struggling to kind of um, pass some of the language that's being used in the classroom, that might make you more distractible because you're not sort of super following what's going on and that in turn could feed back into your problems in the kind of communication domain right is that is absolutely that yeah okay. that's absolutely it yes great i'm always very excited when i get that sort of thing right um, <laughs> you did a much better job than i did so that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's very easy to summarize someone else's work i find <laughs> um so this what brought you to this approach, right? Because this is quite an innovative question to be asking, given that so much of the research literature and kind of practice is based on these kind of diagnostic categories that we that we like to think of as, as being quite sort of robust categories, right? Yeah, I think, well, one of the big drivers is that when we look at particularly the research literature or sort of the clinical manuals we might use to understand why a child is struggling, they do group symptoms according to these very sort of discrete disorders. Um, uh -huh. But when you actually go out and work with children, or if you are a child in the classroom yourself or you're a teacher, you might actually observe that children don't present with neat sets of symptoms. Mm -hmm. So it's very common to encounter a child who is showing symptoms we might have traditionally associated, for example, with both ADHD and dyslexia. And so that doesn't really fit with what the research literature tells us or the clinical manuals. So I was really motivated to run this study to think about, well, if we go out there and we get lots of data on lots of different symptoms associated with these different disorders, 
then can we run some kind of analysis to show what actually happens to the symptoms that children do present within the classroom? Mm. So it's really about sort of modelling the reality of how symptoms might be expressed um, that might reflect better what children tell us themselves about their problems and also about what I've observed in my own research studies and about what parents and teachers have observed in their children. Mm. That was a great motivation for doing a study. Um, so how did you go about doing this then? Also sounds quite complicated. I'm guessing you needed quite a large number of children to participate in this study. Absolutely. And we were very lucky. So we were able to use some data from a big cohort study at the Centre for Attention, Learning and Memory. And what's really unique about the data there is that it's been collected from a large sample of 800 children who have a real mix of different kinds of problems. So some children have diagnoses of dyslexia or ADHD. Other children have no diagnosis at all. But what they all have in common is that a health or an education professional has recognized that they're struggling at school. Mm. So we know that we end up with a sample of about 800 children who were struggling at school. And then we had data from their parents and they had rated the children on a whole range of questionnaires that might be used at school or in clinical practice that assess their communication skills, that measure behaviours related, for example, to ADHD, that measure how well they might use their cognitive skills in their everyday lives. So mm -hmm. we were able to pull all of that data together to look at how the different symptoms were related. And so what about the analysis technique then that you employed? So it mentions a network approach in the title of your paper, and I wondered if you could try and um, help us understand what that looked like. Yes. So an, um, a network approach is a way of modelling an interaction between some variables. In this case, we were using the symptoms of these different um, kinds of problems that children might have. The method that we use, it's based on graph theory, and it sounds really fancy and really complicated. But if you, to put it really simply, it allows you to show how every symptom that you've measured is related to all of the other symptoms that you've measured. Um, I was personally really lucky because I had a very talented PhD student working with me who ran all of the analyses. So my understanding is, is not as detailed as hers, but I was very lucky to have her working on this with me. Um, mm. We actually managed to then, when you've got a sort of, you almost have like a, almost like a network map that shows you how these symptoms are related. So it's mm. a bit like, um, maybe like a tube map, where you have all the stations, and then you mm. can see how they're all connected to each other. Mm. And just like when you look at a tube map, you can identify maybe a tube station that's most closely related to lots of other stations. So, for example, King's Cross. Mm. You can do that with the symptoms as well. So you can look at... Well, is one symptom really central in this map or in this network? And what is it related to? And what that might tell you is that it's a core symptom that might be driving sort of the expression or activation of other symptoms in the network. So it can tell you some quite important information about what symptoms might be really crucial. Um, and some people have suggested that you might be able to use these as targets for intervention and support. Another thing that's really interesting, which was particularly interesting for this study, is that you can use methods to then carve up the network or the map into clusters of symptoms. So you can see how different symptoms cluster together. And then you can say, well, the way that these symptoms are clustering, do they map onto the traditional diagnoses that we have? So, for example, do all of the symptoms related to ADHD group together? So it was really interesting in that way. And actually, we found that that wasn't the case, that when you carve your map up and look at how symptoms naturally group together in this big group of children who are struggling at school, you see that the clusters don't map onto traditional diagnostic groups or groupings of symptoms. And so, I mean, there's, uh, there's so many interesting questions I should, could ask now, but I'm going to try and um, rein myself in. <laughs> I suppose the question that I'm most interested in from that is, is what that means for our kind of diagnostic practice, right? So, yeah. you know, I guess you could argue that the, the, the challenge of mapping is just that 
you know, clinical diagnoses have some sort of clinical validity, but it doesn't map onto, you know, the way that parents um, perceive their their children's kind of strengths and challenges or the way that they're manifesting in education settings, right? So it's just a lack of sort of clinical into um, daily life yeah. mapping. Or maybe it means something a bit more profound, you know, that this, this, um, group of features that we have put into a bucket and labelled ADHD is not actually really a bucket that exists. You know, it's not a natural category. It's just something that the that seemed to hang together with the observational methods that we once had available, and now we need to be, you know, radically rethinking those categories. So, what what do you think about that sort of debate? I, I agree quite strongly with your latter argument there. Right. The, that these sort of features don't fit into these neat buckets or categories. Um, mm. And you could argue that perhaps it's sort of clinical observation playing out in a different way in everyday life and parents' own perspectives being different, for example, to a clinical kind of observation. But there are many other studies out there um, have also shown that these sort of diagnostic-based criteria don't really map on to what you see in the real mm. world. Mm -hmm. um, so, based on that and sort of my own understanding of examples who I've been working with for a number of years, um, I think it is time for kind of a, a radical shake-up of, of how we define children's strengths and weaknesses. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that there's a real challenge to that, though, because sort of the language we use, the vocabulary we use, is very diagnosis-based. Sort of our cultural systems for assessing and supporting children are very diagnosis based and so we can show empirically we perhaps need to move away from these sort of hard boundaries between different disorders maybe we need to reframe things maybe we need to think about it in a different way but there's a huge challenge in trying to do that because it, i think it's going to require sort of a, a quite a, a big cultural shift in how we do assess and support children mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, for one example, at the moment, you have some children are referred through health services for some support and, um, and some assessment and support. Other children are referred through education. So we've even got two completely different, different systems that mm. currently deal with children's strengths and weaknesses. And I think one of the starting points might be sort of harmonizing that into a kind of a single unified system and then moving away from these hard kind of diagnostic cutoffs and boundaries and thinking more about the sort of the space and dimensions upon which children have particular strengths or weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge challenge, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the point that you raised there about the way that these diagnostic labels have such kind of sociocultural meaning is, is a really big deal because as you say, you know, that they're, they're a key that we use to unlock a certain amount of service provision and understanding, Absolutely. right, in an, yes. in an ideal world. I mean, it doesn't always um, unlock as much as we might like. But um, but it's also about people's identities and, and sort of self-understanding and, yes. you know, um, and recognition of of why they might be finding something a struggle or, or you know, that sort of thing. So it's really, it's very important that we don't whip that rug from under people's feet, isn't it? It's very important. And I think mm. that it, what we will have to do, you know, sort of, I know it's going to take a long time and it, and it will require a huge mm. shift in people's thinking, is that we still have to ensure that we think about the individual and people around them and mm. how they can identify with why they might be struggling or what the problems might be that make life difficult for them. Um, and I guess that one way towards that is that you have to develop a new system that still has those very important elements to it. Mm, mm, mm. Absolutely. Well, that sounds like um, you've got some more work to be getting on with in that case, Tony. Yes, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> There's a lot of work to do. I can't it's do part it single handedly. <laughs> it's part of a lifetime approach to, uh, to revolutionising the way that we understand and support young people. But, you know, I've got your back, Tony. I'm right behind you. <laughs> well, domination lies ahead. <laughs> Absolutely. So, 
so obviously we're going to want to, this is going to be such a smooth segue I'm going to do right now. We're going to want to bring along some early career researchers, PhD students with us on this quest to the, to the new future. So yeah. I wondered if you wanted to finish by giving any kind of message to them in terms of, you know, what advice you would give to people who are, you know, maybe kind of starting out in the field. So, yeah, I think it's probably solid advice that people hear all the time, but I think there's no no such thing as a silly question um, or a stupid question. It's like when you, if something comes to mind that puzzles you about a talk you've heard or um, something you've read, that question that you might think is not worth pursuing, it could unfold into something really valuable. So mm. always question things and do pursue your own interests as well. Um, I think sometimes we get drawn towards certain lines of research because we think they might be trendy or exciting at the moment but I would say trust your own instincts about what interests you and what might be an interesting question to ask. That is great advice and I think you know it seems like the work that you've been doing that you've been talking about just now is is obviously the result of, of you know someone being willing to ask a question that maybe felt like it wasn't the sort of question you're supposed to be asking, right? So, yeah, absolutely. It's a question that might challenge so many things on so many fronts, but it's you know it could yield some very important um, results or data or information that could enable us to help and support young people in better ways. Ah, oh, Jamie, such an inspiration. Um, thank you so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. And for anyone who's thanks. and for anyone who's listening, you'll be able to find out more about the work that Joni talked about today by following the links on the podcast page, which is at ed.ac.uk forward slash Salveson dash research. So thank you very much, Joni. Bye. Thank you, Sue. Bye. Okay, we did it. I thought that went quite smoothly. Thank you.